Let's do it. So, ready for the word? You ready for the word? If, if you're ready for the word in the most gangster tone you could give me, just say, let's get it. Oh, I love that. I love that. I love that. Got me, got me some chills. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, um, if you go with me down to scripture, we're going to go to Judges 6, 25 through 32. Um, if you have an Apple, you're going to be there in about two seconds. If you have an Android. I just got to say, you know, it, 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 it has to be said. It has to be said. It has to be said. Amen. Amen. Judges 6, 25 to 32. I'm reading it from the NLT. Bible says, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Pull down your father's altar to bow and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord commanded, uh, but he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Praise God. Early the next morning, as the people t- uh, of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for the destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. But Joash shouted, whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is a god, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. For from then on, Gideon was called Jubal, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. If you are taking notes, which you're probably going to want to do because we got a lot of stuff to go through. Um, we are teaching from the concept and the theme of the cancer of compromise. The cancer of compromise. You could put that on top of your notes. Um, the cancer of compromise. Praise God. We've been in a very interesting past few weeks, right? We're coming off of some very, very powerful words. Uh, I think it was three weeks ago with Pastor Brawley. Uh, he spoke about uh, being a man on a mission, right? Talked about the life of Abraham, right? And how he was called from what was a, a familiar space um, onto where God was calling him to go for future generations, all right? So he gave us some nice steps, some nice principles for us to apply in our own lives. And after that, of course, our own Deacon Brandon, came in with the, the pass it on, right? He was stepping on toes, as he was saying, stepping on toes, asking us that whatever it is that we're learning right now in this season, whatever it is that we have gathered over the course of our lives, it's our responsibility to carry that and share that with the next generation. So, Deacon Brand, we appreciate you for that. And then, of course, Sister D, I don't know where you are. Um, I should have said you're out there. So, Sister D um, came last week with a powerful message from comfort to courage, from comfort to courage, of, of moving past what is familiar, your comfort zone, and, and muster up the courage to go where God's asking you to go. And so look at the past few messages. I don't know if you guys have realized, but there is a concept that has been shared again week by week by week, and that is the concept of promise. Someone say promise. It's the concept of promise that we have been um, exploring more and more in depth because the reality of this situation is that every single believer and also every non-believer as well has a promise over their lives. As people, we are promise-dependent beings, right? We are promise-dependent on our decision-making. We are promise-dependent on our friendships and our relationships, right? Nobody is going to make friends with someone they believe does not hold their promises, Correct? Nobody's going to marry someone who they don't believe holds their promises, right? Because we're a promise-dependent 
beings, if we're choosing a career path, right, we're going to choose the career path that has the a greatest guarantee of a financial reward uh, on the end of, of the journey. So there's a promise element that speaks to us as the people of God because a promise, that is the core of our foundational faith, right? That because we believe in Christ, that we, because we believe in who Jesus is onto us, there is a promise of salvation that we hold deeply on to. You see, promise is not just the core of the foundational faith, but it's something that makes us continue to go to wherever God has asked us to go in this life. Promise. Promise. That's our language as believers. We talk the language of promise. So sometimes you'll find yourself in spaces and situations and settings where you're talking a level of faith, talking a level of hope. And someone may not fully understand because your language is a language of promise. Right? Right? It's promise that wakes us up. It's promise that keeps us going. It's promise that keeps us focused. It is the promise engraved in us that speaks of what God is doing in us and through us. Faith is structured by promise, right? Hope is explained through the language of promise, and without it, there is no hope. Someone push, put your hands on your heart and say, I've got a promise. A little bit louder. Say, I've got a promise. I've got a promise. Praise God. Praise God. So promise, that's what we're going to explore today, right? What a promise is. How does a promise come to pass? And why, as believers, should we travail for the promise, right? Now, check me out. Promise is powerful. Promise is beautiful, right? Promise is amazing. But promise comes with process, all right? It's, it's not fast food. It's not Burger King. You don't just throw in the microwave, pop it out in a minute, you get a, a promise. It's not how it happens. Promise is a process, right? And the process of promise comes from the word of travail. If you're taking notes, it's the word of travail. Some say travail. Travail. When you break down the word travail into the Hebrew definition, it translates to the understanding of that of childbirth or that of labor, right? So when you think about um, someone uh, birthing a child, it's a process before that child actually comes out, right? It, it takes time before you see the manifestation of that which is already on the inside. So in that same definition, in that same space, we understand for us that there's a promise over our lives. It's going to take time. It's going to be a process before we see that promise actually birth out of us at its current time. Promise comes with process. And that process right there, it is called travail. Someone say travail one more time. Someone say travail one more time. Say with everything in your heart. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. I love it. So it's in the travailing of the promise where believers are tested the most. I'm going to say it one more time. It's in the travailing of the promise. Not that you, not when you first hear it. We praise God you heard the promise, right? We praise the God that you're around the promise. But it's in the, the, the travailing for the promise that your faith is tested, your hope is tested, everything you believe about God is tested, and there is a way that God goes about that process, right? It's a three-step process to promise. First is the word. Someone say the word. The word, hallelujah, if you go to Isaiah 55, Bible says that when the word came into the earth, right, that it comes to perform exactly what God has commanded that thing to do. So what that means is there is a word over every person's life, that God's already spoken it before you were born. So whether you realize it or not, that word is performing what it's supposed to do. The word is already going. You don't got to touch it. You got to speak on it because the word does not need your agreement to be what it's supposed to be, right? So the word is going to continue doing what it's supposed to do, and the intended end is the promise. The intended space is the promise. So as the word is processing and performing and doing what it's supposed to do, the promise on the other end, waiting for the word to come to pass because the promise already knows that it is a point in time it is going to come through. So that is how it operates. That when the word comes forth, it's already performing. It's already moving. But there is one thing that we're missing. While the word is doing what it's supposed to do, while the promise is established and waiting for us, what are we doing in the process? Check this out. When the word comes into our lives, we hear it. We see it. We receive it. 
We're praising God for it. All right? We're so we're tired. We're, we're so happy. But we have to travail to see what the word is actually performing. And it's in that space, that is the, 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 the phase of prophecy. Someone say prophecy. You see, prophecy is what carries you to promise. Right? Prophecy carries you to promise. Promise is a, is, a, is a future guarantee that something is going to happen at its appointed time. But you need prophecy to lay out every step of the way because oftentimes when the promise comes in your life, it looks nothing like what's going on currently in your current season. If you're receiving promise, but you don't have an understanding of prophecy, you might, you might uh, be mad at God. You might step away from the Lord. You might even grow in disobedience to God. Because the very thing he's pulling out of your life looks nothing for what you've seen in your past, nothing what you've seen in your family, nothing what you've seen in your community. Because the promise is always going to be bigger than what you could ever imagine. So we need prophecy. Prophecy carries you onto promise. Prophecy is what carries you, is what fuels you, it is what directs you each and every step of the way. So we need that prophecy. But check this out. When we as believers, we're travailing, we're believing, and we're in that process, right? And the prophecy comes forth. That's where it's time to stir up the faith the greatest, right? That's where we get the most challenging. All right, anyone can be at the promise. Anybody can celebrate or praise God. But what happens in the middle? Who is God in the middle? When you break down Psalms 23, 4, it says, they are, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. When you think about the concept of a valley, it's not one mountain, it's multiple mountains. So what that means is, as life goes on, you'll be on mountaintop, and you'll be on valley. And you'll be on mountaintop. And you'll be on valley. And if you don't know how to move through the valleys, you're not going to see what's on the mountaintop. Check me out. Check me out. I got you. I got you. Check me out. There's a, there's a lie in the church, right? And this lie says that, oh, uh, what's for you is for you, all right? That as long as, you know, got your, the blessing got your name on it, all right? And there's truth to that, right? There are tailored blessings for us waiting for us. However, something can be for you and you still miss it. I'm going to say it one more time. Something can be directed for you and you still miss it, right? And so if we're not participating in prophecy, we are sure to miss the promise that God has for us. Some would say participate. I got to participate, because what God has over my life, praise God, what the, the promise that God has over me is far too great for me not to engage right now. I know the prophecy may not make too much sense. I know the prophecy that doesn't have too much instruction added on to it. But the promise is way too big. The promise is way too great for me to stay stuck where I am. It may not make sense right now. But if I get my face stirred up just in the right direction, all I need is one step. All I need is one more step. Because every single prophecy, every single... Uh, a step from God is what moving towards the promise for me. We're, we're talking about Judges. And Judges is one of the most powerful books in the Bible. All right? It is a, a summary of, of understanding from everything that's taken place ever since Genesis. All right? I'm going to give you a two-second summary. Um, you go in the book of Genesis, you see Abraham right, called from his, his father Terah. And his father, Terah, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but Terah was called to the very same land that the people of Israel and judges are occupying right now. However, Bible says that Terah settled in a land that he found comfortable. All right? So the same call on Terah's life, it moved into the life of Abraham. And now, not only is Abraham moving in that call, but he's occupying the land of Canaan. And it's in this space that God is saying, listen, I'm going to bless your next generations, the next nations. This will be a land flowing with milk and honey. However, there will be a time where these people are enslaved by Egyptian captivity, right? So it's in this space that God raised up a man by the name of Moses to set free these captives and take place, uh, and, and take route onto the promised land. If you haven't seen the movie, The Prince of Egypt, you probably should see it because that's a great soundtrack by Whitney Houston and um, whoever else is on it. So I assume everyone's seen this. You know what I'm talking about. But as Moses is 
leading the people of Israel, right? There comes a transition. Someone say transition. There comes a transition where now Joshua is the one taking the reins. And as Joshua takes the reins, he takes the people of Israel uh, to overcome approximately 31 different nations to now occupy the promised land that was promised generations before. So now they're in this space. Now they have won the promise. However, there is instruction with the promise. Promise will come free. It comes with instruction. So God says to the people of Israel, when you get here, I need you to drive out the neighboring nations. Don't cut no deals. Don't you cut corners. Don't you come into these, these, these agreements. But what did the people of Israel do? They disobeyed. So we find the people of Israel cutting corners, making covenants, right, building idols. And now what we see throughout the book of Judges, we see a cycle. Someone say cycle. It's a cycle of disobedience. Coming into sin slash falling, coming to deep repentance, coming to God sending his people free just to come back again to disobedience. And it goes over and over and over again. So what God does, and he brings forth judges, a.k.a. military leaders, to help the people of Israel actually break free from this cycle, right? So as we are going through scripture, we get to this judge by the name of Gideon. And what God's asking Gideon to do is destroy the cancer of compromise, right? Now, we're about to get into it. That's just my introduction. (laughs) Praise God. Praise God. So getting to the actual scripture, the cancer of compromise, right? Um, The compromise is a highly spiritual and highly physical theme, right? And compromise comes with two things, altars and idols. Some say altars and idols. So compromise comes with altars and idols, right? When we think about compromise, we're thinking about ourselves having a promise from God, but uh, because of what the promise may entail, we, we decide to settle for something a little bit less, right? But before you get to that point, there's always an altar and there's always an idol, So altars and idols, that is what compromise is made from. I'm going to give you a couple of definitions real quick so we understand what exactly we're talking about. So like I said before, life is highly spiritual. Can we agree? Life is also highly natural. Can we agree? There's people that we know who are not too much spiritual, but they're very, very natural. So a lot of things operate extremely logical, meaning if it does not make sense to my logical mind, that's not something I'm going to even really entertain. So the language of faith, the language of hope is really a hard language to grasp. Now, on the other end, sometimes we have people who are highly spiritual, can pray all throughout the night, can fast for months, can do all this stuff, break down scripture, praise God. But when it comes to the natural stuff, their their common sense is a... It can use a little work. It can use a little work, right? But life itself, it is highly spiritual and highly natural. So I'm going to let my, uh, my volunteers come on stage. And as they're moving this way, um, let me just tell you what an altar is. So altars are meeting places for dedication. Someone say dedication. Altars are meeting places for dedication. I'm about to bring this full circle in a second. Altars are meeting places for dedication. When you go throughout scripture, uh, people will use altars to um, invoke the attention of the God or the spirit that that altar was dedicated to. Right. So in this scripture... Asherah and Baal are the gods of this land. And people needed to, uh, quote, unquote, provoke these gods to action for the sake of their families, for the sake of their agriculture, for the sake of what they need in their day-to-day living. So on this altar, they would cast sacrifices. On this altar, they would cast animal sacrifices, uh, a drink sacrifice, whatever it may be, just so they can get the attention of that altar. But this is why... God says, do not by any means engage with these people because their altars are to another God. So we are provoking the attention of another God and not the God, Jehovah Jireh. What happens is that you begin to adopt systems. You begin to adopt 
values. You begin to adopt perspectives. You begin to adopt habits. You begin to adopt cultural values. You begin to adopt understandings that does not reflect that which goes back to the original promise that God called you all along. That if God has spoken a promise over your life, it is going to require a level of character, right? It's going to require a level of maturity, a level of wisdom, and a level of understanding. But you do not attain this type of level if you are invoked altars that are not on to God. All right? That's not how it operates. God says if you're going to have an altar, it has to be on to me. Check this out. Everyone here has built an altar. We've all built altars. If you're married, you've built an altar, right? If, you're, if you have a job, you've built an altar, right? If you have been in a relationship on any spectrum, You have built an altar. All of us build altars. That is the natural uh, way of life. That as you progress, you're going to build altars. Foundational systems for your beliefs and your understandings. However, if it's not in the right place and your altar is not dedicated to the right thing, that value, your vision, your your, your habits, your day-to-day habits, whatever it may be, it's going to be a little bit off. All right? So... We see Gideon, and Gideon is asked to do one thing before, before this promise. And he says, God says, cut off and destroy your father's altars, all right? Gideon is given this promise, and he's saying, Gideon, I'm going to use you to set my people free. I'm going to use you to do what only I can do. But before I can take you here, i got to take you back here. Because God knows something that we don't always realize, that when the promise is calling for us to go this way, when we get to the place of travail, and now we have to endure through prophecy, because the promise over there does not look like what's right here. And so what's happening is as, that the prophecies, right, are, are telling me to, to, to move in this direction. Um, I'm thinking, you know, God, uh, I should probably go this way. And then the prophecy says, now nah, go this way. And, I'm, and I come this way. I'm like, okay, okay, this is cool enough and stuff. But it's taking way beyond my time, God. And this doesn't make a whole lot of sense because my friends are over there doing this. And my friends are over here prospering. You know, God, this, this, this is not the life I actually intended. And oftentimes, prophecy takes us to so many loops and hurdles that doesn't make sense that when we get tired, what do we do? We go back to what's familiar. What's up, man? How you doing? Yeah, yes, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. So it's in the altars of the Father that those belief systems, right, the systems of of, of chronic, I mean chronic fear, right, chronic scarcity mindsets, right, chronic poverty, these things that we pray to God uh, for, for, for them to be broken off of us. We pray for our minds to be renewed. We pray for God to transform us. But us doing in our own strength as soon as the travail gets a little bit tough. All we know is that altar is calling us back to what seems so familiar. So now we're in this space and we're trying to navigate because I know there's a promise over my life and I got to go this way. But everything this requires of me, I do not have. Everything this thing requires of me, I, I don't see it in my current life. But I know what this is. I know the language of, of, of poverty. I know the language of, of, of bondage. I know the language of, 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 of extreme insecurity. I know the language language of high levels of fear. I know the language of everything that cannot come with me to where I need to go. So because this is familiar, I will always reject what is new. I told y'all I was going to bring it together. So if I'm not able to recognize this altar for what it is, every time I have a New Year's resolution, oh, it's time to lose this weight, baby. You're going to get right. I try day one, okay? Yeah. Day two, all right, you know? Day three, you know, it's like, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, you know? And then time gets, by February, you know, it's, it's a little, it's, it's, a little it's, it's a lot. But by February, this altar gets louder and louder. So by March, And this is what we call a cycle. Some say cycle. When we find ourselves believing in God for something, we know we want God to move, but something's always calling us back. It's because an altar 
needs to be destroyed. All right. So for us, understand that for what it is. Praise God. Altars are designed to be somewhat of a safe haven, somewhat of a place of satisfaction, somewhat of a place of familiarity and normality on to you. But oftentimes, if it's not, if it's not what God has called you to go, it's always going to keep you back. Now, altars do not work alone. Altars come with idols. Someone say idols. Altars come with idols. So check this out. Altars are, uh, are communication dependent, all right? Altars are communication dependent. So what happens with altars as you're moving, as you're trying to communicate, as you're trying to uh, gain understanding of where you're trying to go, it's always going to confuse you. Idols are sight dependent. Some say sight dependent. Altars are coming to steal your sight, your vision, what you see for yourself, right? In this time, idols were, were, were mainly used. They were mainly un, uh, uh, as, a, as a man-made totem or a man-made uh, pole to have a cultural representation of what that culture believed who God was. And it was believed that if you carry this idol, you're going to get some spiritual power. You see, idols have a sense of representation. But God says, I need you to cut down this idol. So I'm saying cut it down. I got to cut it down because if I do not cut it down, I'm going to give my allegiance. I'm going to give my submission. I'm going to follow a thing that's a false representation of what real power is. And check this out. Idols can be anything you put in the place of God, right? Absolutely anything, right? It, whatever it is, it could, be, it could be something that's even good. Your job can be an idol, your money can be an idol. Can I say it? Your kids can be in. Whatever it is you put in God's space, even if it's a good thing, doesn't mean it's a God thing. So when it comes to idols, God is saying, I need you to cut it down. I need you to remove it because it's in idols. Check this out. I said life is highly spiritual and highly natural. It's in the idols that we set for ourselves that that's where we find purpose. We find direction. We find decisions. We make our decisions. We, 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 we identify our goals that wherever it is, if I'm following this idol, that wherever this idol tells me to go, that's where I'm going to go with it because I believe this idol is going to take me to my destiny. I believe this idol is going to take me to my intended end. But the whole time, I'm, going a whole, I'm taking all these steps. I'm making a whole lot of action. But if we just stop for a second, where exactly am I? In the words of a famous artist by the name of Jermaine Cole, he said, congrats, you, you went a long way, but I'm sorry, you went the wrong way. All right? So altars and idols, they cannot come with you for where God is taking you. Now, check this out. If I can see better and I can hear better, then now I can follow better. All right? Now, if my sight is blocked, because I'm following something that has a false vision for my life, or my hearing is blocked, or my communication is blocked, because I'm always attached to something that for what feels familiar, but it's not, it's not for me to go where I'm destined to go, it's going to be hard for me to stay tuned where the Spirit needs me to be. Hallelujah. I need to be exactly where God needs me to be. I need to be grounded right where God has, because if I'm not here, this is the only one that can take me here. But if I can go here, this has to be destroyed. It has to be broken down. So as we're, as we're uh, moving through, one has to ask, how does someone get to this place? Like, wh why do these altars and idols have such a grip to where I, I just want to go here? I just want to, you know, I just want to get to the bag, get to the money, get to my family, you know, try and get to the end of the journey. But why do these things have such a grip on me? If you go to Ezekiel 8, praise God, um, Ezekiel 8, verses 10 to 13, it says, So I went in and I saw the walls covered with engravings of all kinds of crawling animals and detestable 
creatures. I also saw that the various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. Seventy leaders of Israel were standing there with Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, in the center. Each of them held an incense burner from, excuse me, from which a cloud of incense rose above their heads. Then the Lord said to me, son of man, have you seen what the leaders are of Israel are doing with their idols in dark rooms? Check this out. They are saying the Lord doesn't see us. He has deserted our land. The, the root of compromise is unbelief. The root of compromise is unbelief. I told you in the beginning, the process to promise is not an easy process. And that as you're travailing onto what's going on right here, because of the pain that comes with prophecy, oftentimes there is a trauma attached with the travail. And oftentimes we don't need big things to happen in our lives to shake our faith. We don't need a, a major uh, death in the family or a major shift in our finance. Sometimes it's just the small things, the small rejections over and over and over again. I played, I played football for about most of my life. And one thing I learned is that nobody plays the season fully healthy because little hits you take again and again and again. How many of us can be honest with ourselves? That core, I've, I've taken some hits, all right? And I believe in the God for a promise. And I believe in God that he's going to do something in my, in my life, that he's going to, to transform something uh, in this season of my life. But maybe all the hits that I've taken has allowed unbelief to grow to the point to now this is the only thing I can find actual comfort in. So every time I try to break free, because unbelief is still something I'm continuing to wrestle with, it's really hard for me to see what God has for me. Why is it that in Mark 9 that we see the man who wants his son to get healed, he comes to Jesus if you can. And Jesus says, if I can, all things are possible for him who believes. But he says, help my help my unbelief. Because unless I can actually believe that you are who you say that you are, I'm not going to see a promise come forth in my life. So I need you before you heal my son, before you do the promise, before you perform the miracle in my life, before you take me higher, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. God, I, it's, been, it's been three years now, and I'm still believing you for this thing, but I've taken hits. And the unbelief has grown like never before. And unless you deal with me now in this moment, I'm not going to see what it is you have for me. I'm going to miss it, not because I meant to, but because the hits that I've taken did not allow me to. So first and foremost... If you want to conquer compromise, we have to most definitely deal with unbelief. Four steps to overcome unbelief and compromise. First step is, first, you must repent. You must repent. To repent does not mean apologize, right? It doesn't mean, oh, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> it means to turn away. Admit this is what it is, and I got to turn away, God, because I got somewhere I got to go. Second thing is, you have to submit. Someone say submit. That means I can't just believe that I have everything figured out. I need help. Help me, Holy Spirit. What I got, it It don't make sense, but I trust you. It may not make sense right now. It may actually hurt me, but I know you know what's best for me. I'm following you. Third thing we got to do, we got to replace. Someone say replace. Replace these old altars. You got to replace these things. You got to replace them. You got to replace them out of your life, and you have to build something new. A new system that's going to keep you grounded. No longer am I going back to this space that pulls me back. But I'm building altars of prayer. I'm building altars of word study. I'm building altars in my friendships, altars in my relationships. That when it gets kind of tough, when it gets kind of challenging, and it doesn't make sense, the place I'm going to go back to is that altar that I found comfort in. And every single time, it's going to bring right back to that prophecy. And the prophecy is going to keep me going. And it's not going to make sense again. And I'm going to go back to the altar. And I'm praying. And I'm studying. And I'm fasting and I'm in a small group and I'm doing whatever I need to do in this space to get my faith right back and that place is going to direct me right back to that original idol of the Holy Spirit and he keeps on taking me, he keeps on working with me just for me to get to the intended promise that was already destined for me all along. It was destined for me all along. 
quiet. You guys can come up. It was destined for me all along. I, I, I want you just to think that over your mind. It was destined for me all along. Some of you in here, we, there's things that God has talked to you directly about. Some of you have crazy dreams that you can't put language behind. Some of you have desires that are in the church, some that aren't in the church. Some of you are made for business. Some of you are made for the film industry. Some of you are made for music, whatever. Maybe you are made in different spaces that if we are being honest, it's a little bit unconventional. And then what God is calling to do in these spaces, the promise is way bigger than your family. It's way bigger than your current situation. It's way bigger than anything you can even think, see, or imagine. But the first thing you have to deal with before we destroy the altars and idols, before we break free from things that keep holding us back, is the unbelief. All the rejection, all the things that it was supposed to go our way, but it was sudden delays, all right? The layoffs, the, the whatever it may be, that God, I believe you for this thing, and it, did, it, didn't, it didn't come to pass. It's in this space that we say, God, help my unbelief. Amen. Can we just rise to our feet? And, and Elder James is going to uh, pray us out, and he's going to take us um, in a second. But I just want us to have a second with the Lord. Just put your hands on your heart um, and just ask the Lord, God, remind me of that promise. Remind me of that promise. Remind me of that promise, Father God, wherever I've, I've missed the mark, O oh Lord, wherever, Father God, uh, things have been keeping me back from where you're asking me to go, and it's hard for me to break. God, speak to me right now. May yes. I not leave here the same way that I came in. May I not leave it with the same mindsets, the same ideas, the same perspectives, the same situations. God, I need you to move, O oh Lord. Come on, just for, for 30 seconds, just press in for your promise. Press in for your destiny. Press in for your family, because you recognize the promise is bigger than yourself. If you're someone we know unbelief, has moved in your life more and more. Oh, God, help my unbelief, Jesus. It's something I've been wrestling with for years. Oh, Father God, I just need to believe in you again. I need a revival in my faith. Father God, help my unbelief. Oh, Lord, just take some time. Just It's between you and God. Make that altar with yourself. If you know there's things you constantly go back to that does not and cannot follow where God is calling you to go, God, break me free from this space. I don't want to go back to what's familiar. I want to move on to what is new. I don't want to go back, Father God, to what I know so well, but I need you to break me to a new season, into a new space, into a new situation. If I'm setting any idols, oh God, that I don't even know about, Lord, May they be cut down. May they be cut down, Jesus. May they be cut down. Come on, just press in for yourself. Press in for yourself. Press in for yourself.